If you were forced to solve complex riddles in order to deactivate countless bombs, what would you do? The world's smartest serial killers have a grudge against the Japanese government and will stop at nothing until the whole country gets blown to hell, unless you stop them. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the Sphinx monsters in Terror in Resonance. These two kids, they're going to raise hell all over the country of Japan, and the two of them run and even manage to sneak into this government facility. Dressing up as one of the workers, one of them draws the letter V-O-N on the floor here, right before stealing this bomb. Rushing to the exit, his accomplice waits for him outside of the entrance door, and the two escape the facility. Six months later, they arrive in Tokyo with a mission to destroy the city, and this serious smart kid wearing glasses tells his younger brother not to stand out whatever happens over the next few weeks. But then they come across a group of girls being mean to this one girl called Lisa. One of the brothers notices her and jumps into the pool and she notices the darkness in their eyes. Elsewhere, deep down in the basement of the Tokyo police headquarters, a disgraced ex-detective, Shibazaki, sits, not realizing that he's going to be the man who's going to be tasked with saving the entire country. And just then, they see a suspicious video online posted by two kids wearing masks. How original. They call themselves Sphinx number one and Sphinx number two, and they broadcast a cryptic message to the country. They declare that in less than 24 hours, Tokyo will go into complete darkness, and large sparks will scatter all around the Shinjuku area. Shibazaki's colleagues thinks it's a joke, but hearing this puts him on edge for what's to come. The next day, the two kids go into this building. Glasses Guy tells his brother that they have three minutes until it's go time, and another 26 minutes until the power generators turn back on. But they don't notice that Lisa is there as well, and she heads into the bathroom, suddenly across town. A crane not knocks this electrical wire, causing the whole of Tokyo's electricity to shut down, and emergency sirens blast across the country, and the people in this building begin to evacuate. With the cameras now turned off, the two begin their devastating plan, and start placing these cuddly toys all around these support pillars. Apparently they're gonna blow them up with cuteness. And just then, we see Lisa exiting the bathroom, and then she bumps into one of the brothers, and she locks eyes with his cold stare. He smiles, and gives her a toy that he's holding, and tells her to not let go of it until he says so, and leaves Lisa alone, confused and scared. Back at the police station, their power has gone out. Noting the time, Shibazaki begins to get even more on edge, and thinks that this is no coincidence. He begins looking more into the online video from yesterday, and that's when the emergency generators turn on, and the power is restored, and Glasses Guy here flips the switch and waits. His younger brother enters onto the roof and tells him that Lisa caught him, and so he gave her one of their toys, in case they want to kill her too. The older brother looks at him with an icy stare, right as the toys inside start melting, and the rest of the building quickly begins to blow up. The brothers then call Lisa and tell her that she can die where she stands or become an accomplice in their operation. Terrified beyond belief, Lisa agrees to work with him, and then she is given directions on how to escape the building. Whoa, okay. If I was these bad guys, then I might have just slit Lisa's throat and left her to die instead. <laughs> Let me explain. The sound of the fire alarm would have reached the bathroom, and the sound of those things are freaking loud. They're as loud as a plane taking off, so Lisa coming out of the bathroom acting all oh, scared and confused and oh, what's going on could actually be a front. We cannot be caught. And also, why are they not wearing masks? Like, why would you assume that the cameras were off just because the power was cut? They live in Japan. Japan has over 1,500 earthquakes a year, folks, which means that they are probably set up with backup batteries. I would have done two things differently. First, I would have recruited a makeup artist for this job and would have made them cover parts of my face that are the most identifiable to facial recognition, such as getting some prosthetic, eyebrows, nose, eyes, all that fun stuff. And then I would have murdered that person right after. Because by subtly applying prosthetics to the face, I would have altered my first layer of identity upon first entering the building, and then I would have brought along an actual mask to wear inside. Because I gotta prevent anybody from accidentally seeing my handsome mug. And also, in Encountering Lisa is a whole other issue. For one, her personality earlier, it's clear that she is bent, but not broken. As Charles Manson once said about his own followers, which means that while Lisa would make a great accomplice, her loser issues means that she is too much of a wild card to let live. I can't get caught, so I have to do what I have to do. I need to kill her, make her suffer, but then after I might feel bad and send her family some flowers from an anonymous source. Because hey, I have manners. Heading down these stairs, she gets directed to place her toy in front of this window, and it promptly blows up and down below she sees the younger brother waiting outside with a bike. He tells her to jump and the whole building begins to collapse from the destruction. Escaping the crime scene together, he dry 
drives her to meet up with his brother and tells her that since she is now their accomplice, there's no going back. The police call an emergency meeting to discuss the bombing event, because these aren't ordinary criminals. They report that since the fire alarm went off before the bombing, no one was killed, but due to the large-scale blackout, cameras everywhere were turned off. Knowing a suspicious video surfaced online a day ago, they investigated to see if there was any connection. And this bomb expert then says that the bomb used was a thermite bomb. The heat produced from it is so hot that it melted the building's pillars, which are four times thicker than usual. The heat also caused the fire sprinklers to go off, but the water from the sprinklers got heated up by the bomb, turning into steam. And this is what caused the main explosion, and the blast from this caused the strong pillars to finally break and the building then collapsed. Also, this scientist found letters in the wreckage, hidden away, that spelled V-O-N, and thinks that this was written by the bombers. And that's when they begin to connect the dots. They realize that these letters also appeared at a nuclear facility six months ago, which means that these two cases are now connected and put the police even more on edge. The next day, the police get alerted again that a new video by the bad guys has surfaced online. They claim responsibility for the explosion, and they tell the country that they've now planted a second bomb, and it can only be found if the citizens and the country work together to solve their first riddle. They ask, what first walks on two legs, then on four, and finally on three legs? The cops are confused, as is the rest of us, but they rush to get to work, and they quickly find out that the bad guys are referring to themselves as a sphinx with a P, and not an F sound, which means that they are pronouncing it in the Greek way, and this matters. Because after doing some research, they find out that the sphinx monster appears in Greek mythology, and is known for giving out riddles, and was the most famous in the Greek story of Oedipus Rex. This is cute, but I could have figured out the identities of these criminals in less than seven minutes. Let me explain. If I had to be on the good guy's side for once, how they reacted here makes me think that Japan's law enforcement isn't exactly equipped to handle these bloodthirsty psychopaths. And I'm not even saying that just because Japan's police force creates their own cuddly mascot or boasts a squad of dancing officers. I'm not even kidding, that is a real thing. The reason I'm saying this is because the police force already had everything they needed here to find and locate these criminals by using the most basic profiling technique because we have a video to work with. People have numerous identifiers in order to be able to, well, identify them, like their clothes, posture, hand gestures, and even fingernails. All these details are given to us, which will allow us to have an informed overview of what type of people these bad guys were. Even the color of their hair is visible on the screen, of course they could have dyed it, but anyways, their body was exposed as well. We see their exposed arms, including their non-developed forearms and overall frame, which could have revealed to us their lack of, well, muscle maturity. And this coupled with the fact that their arms look more youthful and means that these bad guys are likely younger than the age of 20. Shibazaki tells to the police the story of Oedipus Rex, which was about a father who was told by an oracle that his son in the future would kill him. And so the father abandoned his kid in the forest and later in the future, the son, not knowing who his real family was, eventually killed his father and accidentally slept with his woe before blinding himself when he found out the truth and then met a sphinx in the process and it offered him this very riddle. Shibazaki here then realizes that the answer to the riddle is man itself due to the three stages in a man's life. They then try and see if the numbers actually match up to any corresponding address in the country, and they find one in Minato. And so the police eagerly rush off to the location, but Shibazaki stays behind because he thinks maybe something is off. Reaching the building, the cops suddenly get a call by him and he tells them that he's discovered a new clue, and he reveals that in Greek mythology, there is actually a second lesser known version of the Oedipus myth that had a different riddle. In that version, the Sphinx asks Oedipus, what has two legs in the morning, four in the afternoon, and three in the evening, a two, four, three progression. Because of this, Shibazaki thinks the answer is Oedipus himself. He tells them that in the myth, after sleeping with his mother, Oedipus fell down to the level of a beast, because what he did was nasty, meaning he had four legs. But later he went blind, and then he finally needed a cane to walk three legs. He also remembers that the bad guys asked the police to solve this specifically and means that Oedipus, in this case, must actually be a police station. Checking the new address that corresponds with the new numbers, he finds out that the address is this police station. The police chief is shocked at Shibazaki's smartness and lets him in on the top secret news, revealing to him that a plutonium bomb was stolen from a nuclear facility, specifically a nuclear fuel processing facility in Amori six months ago. Based on the letters from earlier, the cops know that these guys are the ones behind all of this. He then offers this washed up detective a spot back on the team. Meanwhile, our young villains here begin to work on the next few steps of their plan, and then notice bombs
bomb vans at the crime scene on the news. But they also spot nuclear, biological, and chemical special forces there as well. They think it's kind of weird, and they begin to think that the police have finally connected them with what happened six months ago. Glasses guy tells his younger brother the next bomb they plant will help them know for sure. Later, the cops go through the police station cameras and discovers this one person sneaking in and think that this person must be one of the bad guys. They get word that he posed as a delivery man and thinks that he must have planted the bomb there himself. The police chief then tells Shibazaki that one of the suspects who stole the plutonium bomb six months ago actually worked at the facility for a short time but under a fake identity. And they deleted their records and now all they have is a drawing of one of the suspects. Shibazaki sees that the bad guy is just a kid and thinks that this doesn't add up. And just then the police get word that they found the person responsible for the blackout. Interrogating him, this construction worker confesses that he got an email from someone ordering him to take out the city's power in exchange for two million yen. And Shibazaki wonders why did these such well-prepared criminals leave behind an email that could be traced? They're too good for this. And the video evidence from the police station? Why? He begins to suspect that these criminals are intentionally leaving behind evidence. And just then they get alerted that another video has uploaded and they propose their next riddle. What's the building next to the house of God who solved the riddle? Before the video ends, one of the bad guys goes off script and tells the police to drag their legs behind them until they have to walk like a cripple. Afterwards, Shibazaki gets to work on the riddle and thinks that the house of God refers to a shrine, but thinks they are now talking about a Japanese god, since, well, they're in Japan. And he says, why did one of the bad guys say we need to drag our feet? And he thinks that this refers to the fact that Oedipus had a swollen foot for much of his life. And then something clicks in his head, and he realizes that Oedipus's mother had an ancestor who was a dragon, and he comes up with an insane plan. Okay, these clues are starting to make no sense. And this is why I would become best friends with a whole bunch of Japanese grandmas. Let me explain. Okay, up until now, all of these riddles have been based off of pre-existing myths. And this means that anybody with Wi-Fi would have been able to solve this in five minutes. Yet the criminals seem to be targeting the police station specifically. And also, one of the bad guys gave us a very interesting bit of information. Because they went off script, which clearly shows that despite their intelligence, they're still kids at heart, which is something that we can use. Since the bad guys keep sending us a video, we could use a technique known as photogrammetry, which is the science of measuring height in photographs and video frames, which will be able to give us an accurate height description of them. We already know their hair color from past videos, their build, and now their height, so we could create a fairly accurate suspect description of them by now. And at this point, their doings has now become known to the entire Japanese public, which means we will be able to reach out to the people to help us stop them. And unlike other countries, Japan not only has police stations, but cute little mini police stations as well, known as Kabans, and using these is how we'll catch them. Kabans are designed to act more like neighborhood watch groups that look after the community and get more personally involved in everybody's business. And they check in with local businesses and even become friends with the locals, including those Japanese grandmas that I was talking about earlier. The best part is that there are over 6,000 Kabans in the country and they are everywhere, which is why handing out the description of the bad guys to all of these Kabans to their people will double the chances of us finding these guys. Because who wouldn't want to help out their friendly neighborhood watch group. He broadcasts his answers for the bad guys online and tells them that he's figured out that Oedipus's mother had an ancestor who was a dragon. And since dragons are known for dragging their feet, he figured out that the most famous dragon in Japan is a god named Arahabaki, aka the god of feet. This god is found in the Kanto and Tohoku regions, and the most famous shrine for it is located in the Miyagi prefecture. But this god is also worshipped within Tokyo at this shrine nearby, and is very likely where where the bomb is. The police quickly rush over to the shrine in Tokyo and sure enough, find the bomb and quickly disarm it. And they save Tokyo from yet another explosion. Elsewhere, the news of the next bomb quickly appears on TV and the bad guys see hazmat suits at the crime scene. And this confirms what they're thinking. The government officially knows that they are the ones who stole the plutonium bomb, meaning that everything is going according to plan. The next day, the police continue to try and find out who made the second bomb, but they're too dumb and they can't find anything. Shibazaki then decides to investigate the town where the plutonium was stolen, just to see if he can find any clues. Reaching there, he talks to this one employee who spoke to one of the bad guys. The man tells Shibazaki that he was just a kid who didn't speak much, but at one time mentioned to him that he was listening to music from a cold land. And so they had some more small talk, but the kid got triggered because he asked him about his dad. Shibazaki then realizes that the bad guys must have 
some daddy issues. Which means this really does have something to do with the story of Oedipus. And then he heads back to Tokyo. And there the police force receive a new video from the bad guys, asking them to solve a yet again another riddle. At the place where the king solved the riddle, he received a scary prophecy. Whose name would you carve on its entrance? The video tells them that if they don't solve this riddle, their biggest bomb will go off. But the bad guys then mention something strange. And they say that in order to get to the location where the king solved the riddle, they must not use a staircase made of bronze, but one made of letters instead. And if the world figures out this riddle, they can find the bad guys waiting at the king's final destination. But whatever they do, they mustn't cheat. And then the video ends. Shibazaki rushes back to the station and gets to work. He tells everyone that the king who solved the riddle was Oedipus, and that his final destination was the underworld. After being blindsided, Oedipus Oedipus's two daughters led him down a bronze staircase in the underworld, but Shibazaki notes that the bad guy said to use letters instead of stairs to reach this place, and then it hits him. He goes to the online video of the bad guys, and he goes down the staircase of the comments section, and there he sees a link. Opening it, a game appears on screen, and they see a timer go off. Shibazaki tells everyone that in the myth, when Oedipus reached the underworld, he came across a temple where he met a woman, and the woman told him of a prophecy, and on the entrance to the temple, there were three rules written, know thyself, nothing in excess, and make a pledge, and mischief is nigh. Shibazaki thinks that if they enter the name of the person this game is referring to here, then the bomb will be deactivated. But the rest of the police force thinks that since the bomb was near a shrine last time, then it might be in a temple this time. Not waiting for Shibazaki to figure it out, they rush over to find the bomb. And Shibazaki tells this one guy that this is the first time that the criminals have made a request. It says that the last time they said to search for the bomb, but this time they said they must stop the bomb, and they said this on purpose. On another floor, the police go through the camera tapes of the area and identify someone riding a bike just like the suspect who entered the police station earlier, tracking him. They see him carry a mysterious package into this building, and the police rush over there to check it out. But that's when Shibazaki suddenly remembers that there were four rules written on the temple in the underworld. The fourth rule stated to know thyself, and now he thinks that the game is addressing him specifically, taking a huge risk. He types his name into the game, and it accepts. And that's when he realizes that the timer hasn't stopped going down, and he begins to panic as the game tells him that someone is cheating. Accessing the cameras in the room where the bomb is, Shibazaki sees that the police are approaching the bomb, and that's when the timer goes off and everything explodes online. And he realizes that this wasn't a real bomb, but a bug set off within the police network set to leak all of the police's investigation reports on the recent bombings, and they now realize their biggest mistake. One week later the nightmare continues. The police data link has exposed how little the Japanese police know of the bombings. And now, the United States has come in to intervene, sending someone special to finish the job. The police chief gets called into his own office and sees a group of American strangers sitting there, along with one young, white-haired girl. And suddenly another video pops up online, and another riddle. Where do you connect the dots between the punishment of FEZ5889 and the angel who planted the grape Vine. The bad guys then declare they have until 8 p.m. tonight to solve it. Shibazaki quickly figures out that the number given is actually an old police case file about an incident that happened at a school. There, four students who were late to school practice were forced to run outside in 35 Celsius weather as punishment and ended up getting heat stroke, but the charges against the teacher responsible were dropped, and Shibazaki still doesn't know how the heck this is connected to anything and knows that the bad guys are now specifically addressing the police. And then he remembers the second part of the riddle. In the Bible, an angel planted a grapevine in the Garden of Eden, and this caused the wrath of God. The angel's name was Samuel, also known as the Red Serpent, and he was forced to run. Shibazaki compares the Red Serpent to modern day and realizes that it must be a train. Oh my gosh, it hits him. The Red Line of Tokyo, meaning the bomb is located somewhere along the Shuto Shinjuku Line. The police force rush over to find it, while Shibazaki stays back and begins to connect the dots further. The first bomb was located at the head of the Tokyo Metropolitan Government Building. The second bomb was where the chief of police was stationed, and the attempted third bomb was found right next to the building where the former chief cabinet secretary worked, and who is the head of the municipal organization that manages the Shuto Shinjuku Line. And that's when he discovers something huge, and figures out that all of these members took part in a seminar together run by an organization known as the Rising Peace Academy, a non-profit company that has attracted a lot of powerful people, and this company might be what the bad guys are targeting. This discovery of a cooperation between political figures and a company means that we are probably already dead. 
this group in comparison seems even bigger than the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, specifically one known as Big Pharma. These multinational corporations hold the key to making healthcare accessible to over 2 billion people worldwide and have a strong influence over doctors, media, and politicians. However, the rising peace academy is even bigger than that, and anyone who's ever gone up against them has mysteriously disappeared. At this point, I would have stopped this silly cat and mouse games by upping the security in and around Tokyo, because this would have greatly reduced the bad guy's capabilities, and I'm shocked police haven't done any of that right from the very beginning. As for the bomb, it's way too late to do much. Due to the modern age we live in, it's likely that the next bomb is specifically going to be designed to be activated by an incoming cell phone call that will trigger the explosion. At this point, our best move would be to first order the evacuation of all the passengers on the red line trains, before directing the trains themselves to the nearest subway yard if possible. If you didn't know, doing this could allow the bomb to go off in a way more controlled fashion. Meanwhile, the young bad guys scour the internet online, but find it strange that no one has found the bomb yet. And that's when they realize that they also suddenly have no signal on their phones, and neither does the whole of Tokyo. This was never part of their plan. And they begin to realize that if the police don't find the bomb, then it will blow up. For real! Sensing something is wrong, the younger brother runs off to try and find the train, but the older brother finds out that someone is now hacking their laptops, and he gets a mysterious text from someone telling him that they found them. The older brother realizes who he's up against, and he quickly discovers the train's location, figuring it out that it's near their apartment. Rushing to his station, he sees the train approaching and sets off a smoke bomb to make everybody panic and get off the train. But that's when he sees a little girl sitting there, and he jumps in to save her, right as the whole train blows up. Back at the police station, the police force gets word that the bomb planted by the bad guys has just gone off. Freaking out, Shibazaki rushes to see the police chief to figure out what the hell is going on. The police chief confesses that this wasn't his fault and reveals that a special team sent from America recently took over the operation and they assured him that they would stop the bomb. Shibazaki demands to know who is in charge and then finally notices a strange man and a girl sitting in the corner. And they tell him that ever since the data leak, the US government doesn't trust the Japanese to handle this and they have now taken over the operation and the girl introduces herself to them as Phi and she will do whatever it takes to find the bad guys. The next day another riddle gets posted by the bad guys but this time it's a simple text instead. Julius Caesar gone to Arab. At the police station, Shibazaki thinks this next riddle is what is known as a Caesar cipher, which is a simple encoding technique that shifts each letter down to a fixed number of places down the alphabet. Encrypting a word like, say, cookie into these will come up with F, R, R, N, L, H, random numbers. Using this technique, Shibazaki decrypts the riddle and finds out that the next location of the bomb is at the Haneda International Airport. He quickly gets ready to head over there, but begins to think that this message wasn't by the real bad guys, because the riddle is too simple, it doesn't fit the MO. And just then, one of the police bosses announces that the FBI has ordered the Tokyo police to sit this one out, resulting in outrage in everybody here. But Shibazaki doesn't listen and sneaks out, running into his crew who has also got the same idea, and they all secretly go against orders and head out to the airport. Meanwhile, the bad guys have also decrypted the riddle, and discuss who the copycat really is because they know who hacked them, and they think that this person will likely blow up the bomb for real because they are actually crazy. And they come up with an idea to use their hostage Lisa in their plan because no one knows about her. Quickly reaching the airport, the two kids then notice all of the airport screens suddenly turn into a chessboard and thinks that their copycat wants them to play a game together. And if they win, they'll find the location of the bomb and the two quickly split up and begin to follow the chess pieces on screen. Meanwhile, Shibazaki's men finally have reached the airport, but they notice the weird numbers also on the screen and they go talk to the airport security and find out that the FBI has taken over the airport and is behind all the weird numbers on screen. And they realize that the FBI must have set up this whole thing in order to lure in the real bad guys, who are also probably here too. Shibazaki thinks that these numbers on screen represent chess moves, so he tells his guys to play the game as well, because this will lead them to where the real bad guys are. Meanwhile, the older brother calls up his hostage Leah, who nobody recognizes, and he orders her to set off a smoke alarm, causing Causing panic in the airport, people begin to leave, but Five notices Lisa through the security cameras and she whispers something to FBI guy. She then tracks the older brother through the screen as well, but suddenly soon realizes that she's watching a recorded tape. She quickly rushes out of the police trailer right as the older brother holds her up at gunpoint.
point, and he asks why is she getting in his way, and she says that she's just trying to settle the score based on their chess game. The older brother tells her that he knows where the bomb is, but she reveals one more trick up her sleeve, and tells him that she's kidnapped Lisa and has put her with the bomb. And then the Japanese police arrive and begin shooting at this kid, forcing him to run away and come up with a new plan. Nearby, Shibazaki's crew hear gunshots and run to the location, and they run past the same kid. The older kid reaches his brother and tells him that Lisa's been kidnapped and is now stuck with the bomb. And just then, they get a call from Lisa telling them that she's in trouble, and the plane is on autopilot, and now the plane is headed right to them, right where most of the innocent people are. The older brother realizes that Five must be in the control tower, directing the other planes to avoid crashing into the bomb, and now thinks that the tower is crawling with cops. Not knowing what to do, they call Shibazaki and confess to him that the bomb is not theirs, but they know where it's headed, towards gate 106. And they tell him to go to the control room and stop the bomb himself, and these two grab an airport car and begin racing over to save Lisa. Meanwhile, Shibazaki rushes to the control tower with his police buddies, and he busts through this door and quickly directs the plane away from the crowded terminal, allowing the bomb to blow up safely and prevent the deaths of everyone here. But he notices the bad guys through the window, and they escape with a girl. The next day, Shibazaki and his guys get suspended from the investigation, and he tells his boss that the Sphinx group are not guilty of that bombing and are being framed. But nobody listens to him, and then he goes to talk to his police chief, and he asks him who white-haired girl really is, and he tells Shibazaki that he's looked into her, and has found out that she is a former spy, and this puts the two on edge and wonder what is a spy doing on this case, and why is the US so interested in this stolen bomb? The police chief warned Shibazaki that this case is much deeper than he thinks. Shibazaki then heads to the public records office to investigate more into the officials that the bad guys have been targeting, searching around to figure out how they are connected to the Rising Peace Academy, and discovers that they conducted something called the Athena Plan five years ago, and then an idea hits him, and he rushes back to his office. There, he finds an old police case file about a young kid who injured someone. According to the report, this kid was let off the hook thanks to his powerful dad who is a politician and was a member of the Rising Peace Academy. Shibazaki then heads to that politician's office and blackmails him into revealing everything and he finds out that 10 years ago, this corporation had a goal meant to educate gifted children by putting them through terrifying scientific experiments. But to do this, the company began recruiting smart children from just orphanages around the country. Getting the names of all the orphanages, Shibazaki heads off to interview each one, but runs into his old partner on the way out, wanting to help. The two team up to get to the bottom of this mystery. But through all of this, they find out from one orphanage that years ago, a government official took one of their children, but left his business card. Using it, they head over to see that official. Meanwhile, Lisa overhears the plans of the bad guys, and hears them mention that they want to get rid of her because it's too dangerous for her. So she runs away. But that's when she gets spotted and kidnapped by five. Now trapped and facing real death, Lisa confesses that the bad guys threatened her to be their accomplice. But Five says that she should have just died instead, and mentions that she will now be used as bait to lure her enemies in. Elsewhere, Shibazaki and his partner finally reach the government official's house, but the old man tells him that he's been expecting them for years. Going inside, he confesses everything, saying that he's too old to care to hide it anymore, and he confirms that the existence of the Athena plan is real. He reveals to them that the last person who tried to expose this project was the Minister of Health, and he mysteriously died before he could tell the police. And he warns these two that they are putting their lives also on the line by investigating this case. The old man confirms that the organization tried to create super intelligent children with a smarter drug that was accidentally developed in the late 90s. 26 children were used for the experiment, but most of them died. The experiment was deemed a failure, but towards the end, the US government became aware of this experiment and shut it down. But one little girl survived the experiment, and an American agency took custody of her. Shibazaki asks if there were others who survived, but the old man tells him that there were rumors of two more children escaping the facility, but he doesn't know for sure. Shibazaki asks for the names, and he tells them that they were never assigned names, only numbers. One of the kids was named 9, and the other was named 12. And since this event happened decades ago, the old man thinks that the kids must be late teenagers by now, and Shibazaki confirms it with the police sketch from earlier. But the government official tells him that if any of the children are still alive, they will soon die, when the smart drug side effect eventually will take over. Shibazaki finds out that the person in charge of this project was someone named Dr. Mamiya. Shocking him to the core, he leaves the government official's house, and he tells his partner that 10 years ago he accused Dr. Mamiya of being involved with some shady stuff, but it was never proven, and it was the reason why he got demoted in his 
job elsewhere. Five ties up Lisa and uses her as bait to lure in her friends. And just then, Twelve rushes to her location but finds Lisa with a bomb strapped to her chest. And she confesses that due to her abusive family, Twelve and Nine are the only ones who ever treated her like family. But she didn't want to be a burden to them, which is why she ran away. Twelve tells her that they are glad to have met her and he tries to calm her down while struggling to disarm the bomb. And then Five suddenly calls him up and offers to make a trade, Lisa's life and his freedom for the location of the plutonium bomb. She reveals to Twelve why she knows why this bomb is so important. The world thinks these kids stole a bomb, but what they really stole was Japan's first attempt at making their very own atomic bomb developed behind closed doors. Twelve is shocked and the timer gets closer to running out. Desperate to save Lisa, he caves and reveals that the bomb is at their school. FBI guy then radios his men to rush over to the location and Lisa passes out. Minutes later, the FBI reach the school but run into Nine, attempting to move the stolen bomb, and he quickly escapes and is now forced to come up with a new plan. The next day, he hands himself over to the police. News of his arrest reaches FBI guy at the hospital with Five, and he quickly calls up his powerful boss, a mysterious US official, and he tells his boss that he'll be handling killing Nine before he can talk. Back at the police station, they interrogate him, but Nine threatens them with his atomic bomb, saying that if they don't listen to him, he will destroy everything. Listening to his demands, Nine asks for the city to set up a live press conference later tonight where he plans to reveal something shocking but doesn't realize he's never going to get the chance. Meanwhile, Shibazaki, still tracking down leads, heads to Dr. Mamiya's house. The man who was in charge of the Athena project, old and now on his deathbed, Dr. Mamiya confesses that Japan never got over their defeat in World War II and this is why they developed the Athena plan, to create something more useful than a weapon. But since the project failed, it encouraged the officials in Japan to seek create a new atomic bomb instead. A bomb that those kids stole. Shibazaki warns Mr. Mamiya that he's going down for this, but the old man smiles and says that no one will ever believe him, and then he gets word that Nine has just turned himself in. He rushes over back to the police station, but isn't allowed to see the suspect. Thinking quick, he tells his police chief to not let anyone have Nine no matter what happens. The police chief then secretly tells him the location of the press conference, and he gets ready to go there. Meanwhile, the FBI retreats five from the hospital, and he tells her that they need proof that Japan has started to produce atomic bombs behind closed doors, and they need to retrieve the bomb as evidence. Five mentions that her headaches have started to get worse, but FBI guy tells her that she needs to focus on her job or else she's dead. Calling the police, he asks for his team to escort Nine to the press conference, but the police tell him that part of Nine's demands are for him to be escorted by the Japanese police only. But this guy has other plans. A little bit later, the police finally light up their sirens and head off with the nine to the press conference, but then five and FBI guys show up and shoot the wheels off of this van, about to kill nine. But then they get intercepted by 12 on a motorbike, and he quickly disables five's car, and both of them crash. About to get a hold of nine, FBI guy points his gun at five and tells her that she's relieved of her duties, but she quickly kills him before he gets the chance, telling him that no one else can have nine. He's all hers. She tells him that she always wanted to beat him, and now that this is finally her chance, this is what has kept her going for years. And nine tells her that uh, he's sorry for what they went through, but she tells him to live for her because she's running out of time. Wishing him good luck, she shoots the leaked fuel of this car and blows herself up, forcing Nine to watch this in sadness. And him and Twelve split up to finish their mission. Just then, a pre-recorded message by them goes live online, announcing to the world that today's press conference is cancelled and reveals to everyone that they have one last bomb to go off, set to go off in a few hours, and no one can stop it. At the press conference, Shibazaki quickly gets word that the city has begun to evacuate, but he still thinks that this isn't what it looks like, because these kids have never killed anyone with a bomb actually. Having an idea then, he then calls his super smart daughter who is also studying to be a scientist, and asks her if it is possible for an atomic bomb to explode without killing anyone. She tells him that if the bomb is detonated up high enough into the air, it could result in a high altitude nuclear explosion. Shibazaki thinks that this is how 9 and 12 would be able to pull this off, but his partner thinks that they could do this with a giant bomb. Balloon. Checking with the city's camera, Shibazaki's team quickly locates a balloon taking off around 40 minutes ago, and this smart scientist guy then says that a high altitude nuclear explosion means that it would be detonated in the upper atmosphere, and the radiation will disperse into space, but will have a strong electromagnetic pulse be generated, and this will destroy all 
of the electronics in Japan. Horrified, they get word that the balloon is now gone way too high, too high up to be intercepted, and the country prepares to brace themselves for the end of the modern world. Oh man, this is nuts. Because this explosion is not just bad, it's terrifying. Shibazaki thinks that the EMP pulse will simply just take out the country's power grid? I don't know if he's really thinking about the big picture here, because in reality, those things need more power than he thinks, because the blast from the EMP will be enough to kill everybody with a pacemaker in it or is on life support in the hospital, and this means that not only is the super smart detective here smart, he's also really dumb, because this means that even the bad guys haven't thought this plan through enough. It's noted that the bad guys have been known for not killing anyone in their explosions, but this one contradicts everything they've done, and since we can't trust anyone here, guess we gotta do what we gotta do and take care of ourselves. We have to do whatever we can to protect ourselves from any radioactive residue that could reach us and penetrate our skin. And if I can't find anything that would protect myself from radiation, then I might as well find the next thing that I can insert myself into. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kill my partner, stab him with a knife, and then cut him open, take out his organs, and then I would just nestle inside like a cute little burrito or like a Japanese Luke Skywalker. Because doing this will give us the best chance of surviving the radiation that will fall from the bomb. Because that's how science works. The bomb finally explodes in the sky, and the two kids, Lisa and the country watch in sheer awe, and Japan plunges into the dark ages. The next day, the two kids bring Lisa to the place where they were raised, the terrifying institution run by the Athena Project, and they pay their respects to their dead friends, and they thank Lisa for being their only friend, and spend the day hanging out with her. That evening, Shibazaki finally tracks them down, and revealed to him that he was always there, Oedipus, and was the only one who could have figured this all out. Their horrifying actions was the only way to bring attention to this place. Lisa tells Shibazaki that her mother was a psycho, and was kicked out of her home. These two were the only people that ever took care of her. Shibazaki then grants their wishes, ignoring Lisa, and tells them that they are now finally under arrest. But then the US forces show up in the sky, shocked. Nine quickly reveals that he has more bombs planted around the country, if they try to stop him. With his sights set on these two kids, this military guy then gets word from a mysterious US general, and he tells this guy to take the shot, because no one can know what happened here. Taking orders, he fires a shot straight into 12, killing him in front of everyone, and Nine becomes furious and gets ready to set off the bomb in his hand, but Shibazaki blocks him from the sniper's view and promises him that he'll make everything here show up in court. Trusting him, Nine hands him the remote and thanks him, telling him to remember them, and he passes out for good. One year later, news of what happened at Rising Peace Academy and the government's involvement went viral, and the world brought the real bad guys to justice. Meanwhile, though, Lisa goes to visit the graves of her dear friends, and she bumps into Shibazaki, who also has come to pay them a visit. Lisa thanks him for what he did, and tells him a story about Nine, and says that he always liked listening to music. One time she asked him what music he was listening to, and he said he was music from a cold land, from Iceland. Shibazaki then finally connects the dots, as Lisa tells him that V-O-N is an Icelandic word. It means hope. And the two part ways, and I can finally be done talking about this weird anime for good. But what do you guys think about the video? Let us know what you like about it, and what you didn't like about it. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. And as always, don't forget to check out our How To Be playlist.